Hello and welcome everyone. They're coming in still. Hello and welcome everyone. We'll get the meeting started here in about one or two minutes. Just got to adjust a few things and then we'll be all set. Hey, Devin, if people keep popping in, are you able to hit admit? I know. Um, did you have that function? If not, I can. Yeah, I did. OK, cool. I thought I turned it off, but it's still on for some reason. But if a few more people pop in there, we'll just admit them as okay. they come through. All right. All right, welcome everybody to our risk management webinar. We had one of these last year on river crossings and fire. Um, if you're interested in that one, it's available on our YouTube channel. Um, based on a bunch of feedback we got, you know, a lot of people are wondering about more information about kind of mitigating wildlife risk. And then um, also, I think just due to the prevalence of lightning in the Rockies, especially during peak hiking season, I thought I would add that in too. Before we get started tonight, I just want to do a bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, the Great Divide Trail Association is committed to reconciliation, which starts by taking this and every opportunity to acknowledge our honor and privilege to live, work, and play within the Treaty 7 territory. We honor and acknowledge that the GDT passes through the traditional indigenous territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Stony Nakona, the Sutina, Cree, Shwetmik, Lake Litene, Tanaha, Sinaiks, and Métis Nations. The Great Divide Trail Association would like to invite you to advocate for what you love and to pres preserve nature for future generations to enjoy while educating yourselves and others on Indigenous history and perspectives, um, particularly in the area that we get to play, which is the Canadian Rockies. I don't think this is going to come as a surprise to many people, but this is being put on by the Great Divide Trail Association. Um, you've probably seen this slide before if you've been to our webinars before, but I just want to kind of Reiterate that you know we're a volunteer based organization. We're a nonprofit. We work on hundreds of kilometers of trail every year, and we are the sole organization advocating on behalf of Canada's longest hiking trail. Um, a couple ways you can help being here is a huge start. Thank you everybody for engaging with the association and coming out to these webinars. Um, besides that, membership is huge for us. Um, Sometimes we forget to mention that if you're 25 or under, you get free membership and you get the same perks as every other member. So if you know somebody that's under 25 and they enjoy spending time outside, I urge you to let them know they can sign up for free. You get discounts on a bunch of stuff. It takes like five minutes to sign up, if that. Um, and it really helps us when we go to you know parks, for example, to kind of really advocate on behalf of the through hiker permit that we're working on right now. Having a bigger membership base really shows a, a greater impact that we're going to have. Um, also, volunteering is huge. We're currently redoing our volunteer page to kind of give people more insight into what volunteer opportunities are available. Um, specifically, like what committees are what we what committees we have, what committees are currently working on, and uh, any needs committees have. And thirdly is donations. Donations are huge. It's um, where we get almost all of our money except for the, the small amount of merch that we sell and some of the donations people have for webinars. Um, and just wanted to reiterate right now the Make It Monthly campaign that we have going on through the end of the month. Um, the Government of Canada is giving $20 for every new monthly donor we have, and a private donor is matching a one-month donation for every all new donors. So if you're thinking about donating, um, March is great because there's a bunch of kind of stacked on perks that we get in addition to uh, just normal donations. 
For a bit of a timeline on things coming up, next week we have a natural history webinar with a geologist. We're going to be talking about how the Rockies formed, and he has it from like a very GDT um, specific approach. So he talks about a lot of prominent features along the GDT, um, how these were formed, different types of glaciers you can see with specific instances um, uh, about the glaciers you see on a GDT hike. The info for this will be going out tomorrow morning. And just to um, remind everybody about our membership benefits, discounts at all these awesome organizations, also a discount on um, the shuttle to from Calgary to Waterton. Um, so if you are flying in to Calgary and you want to get to the GDT, uh, the discount alone makes up for your membership price, um, as well as all the other things like the Jasper Downtown Hostel, gear trade if you need um, any kind of gear. Um, they're near Calgary, Durston gear, that's a huge one. Um, and yeah, everybody else, huge thanks for supporting uh, our members. So tonight we're joined by Devin Kelly. He's a conservation officer in Saskatchewan, and he's a member of the GDTA, and he's been helping out on some of the committees for a while. Um, and he's going to chat with us about wildlife. Devin, you want to take it away? Yes, thanks. Uh, so as Austin said, I'm conservation officer out of Saskatchewan, and I'm going to share some knowledge about a few different species. We're going to talk cervids, bears, cougars, wolves. We're going to throw in a little bit on goats, uh, sheep, and caribou. Um, so it's just really important to know that every wildlife encounter is going to be different than last. Uh, no two encounters are going to be the same, although you might find similarities amongst all your encounters. Uh, so we're going to go over how to be ways to be vigilant when you're in the wilderness, uh, paying attention to the signs that are around you, whether it be the tracks of the animals, uh, scat that you see, recognizing when you're in high feed areas where these uh, animals are living. And then being aware of uh, carrion that might be around as well. It's very obvious to smell. Um, if you're close by, you'll know something's off. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so cervids are species like elk, moose, deer. Uh, we have majority um, mule deer in the area of the Great Divide Trail, but there will also be some white tail. All of them are herbivores, so they eat plants exclusively, and all of them will be a prey species for predators. Uh, this, the nature of prey species means that they're likely not going to be an aggressive encounter for you, um, but they may, they'll be very aware of when you're there. They're not going to move away just because you're in the area. They they like to conserve their energy just like everybody else. <clears throat> and <laughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, and they are a lot bigger than us, so they're not really concerned with our presence being there. Most of the time, you'll find that they'll be busy eating. They might just stand there and watch you. And you can pay attention to their body language to determine whether or not you think they're going to be a risk to you. There are certain times a year where wildlife is going to be more uh, testy with people. Um, in the early season, between late May into June, um, the females are giving birth to their calves or their fawns. And at this point, the calves and fawns aren't very mobile. Um, and with that, the, the does or cows will be very protective of them. This will go on for a few months as the, as the young are getting more mobile and more able to get away from predators on their own. Um, one thing that you will notice with deer, not so much elk and moose because they become more mobile quickly, is that deer will leave their fawns unattended for long periods of time. So you actually might come across a fawn that's not going to have the doe around it for quite some time. The best thing to do in these cases is just uh, calmly just move away and give them the space. Fawns are born with very, very little scent to make them very 
uh, hidden to predators that are trying to sniff them out. They'll also lay very, very still. And depending where they decide to lay down once we encounter them, could actually be a safety issue for them. So that's why it's best just to keep moving along. Um, the most distinctive way to tell the difference between a male and female cervid is going to be the antlers. All the pictures in these slides have uh, antlers. So on the right, we have an elk, a bull elk. Up in the top left, we have two bull elk. And then down on the bottom left, we have a bull moose. <clears throat> You'll notice that the elk antlers actually resemble an E, the way that they lay back, like a capital E, which is an easy way to recognize them. Moose, their antlers palmate out, um, which is the like palm of our hand, very flat and very paddle like. Deer will come in two different styles. The mule deer are a forked antler, which I actually brought with me. So this would be a mule deer where the main beam comes up and then wise off, and it does the same thing here on its other main beam. Whitetail have a main beam that come along and then each tine branches off from there. So during the rut season um, is when species will become more aggressive uh, and it'll be the male species or the males at this time that can be more aggressive. Elk will be particularly dominant on their harem because they don't want the competition with other bulls. And so will bull moose. Bull moose will generally move away, whereas elk may be more confrontational and try to push you off. So the best thing to do during the rut season is just give them their space so that they can do their thing this time of year. Um, you'll hear quite often elk will be bugling, which is quite loud and vocal. And it's a very neat experience to hear. The moose are also a very vocal animal, um, but they may be quiet. They will be quieter in comparison to elk. Theirs is a lower tone than the elk are, which have kind of a screaming bugle. Deer have more of a grunt to them this time of year. And although they get competitive with each other, they're generally not a risk to hikers or travelers in the area. We could jump to the next slide. So I've mentioned body language um, when it comes to understanding what an animal is perceiving of our presence uh, around them. So this is a young moose um, that I had encountered while it was feeding. And initially it was very okay with me being in the area. And then quite quickly, it didn't like my presence. So you can see its head kind of lowered. Its eyes are very focused on me. Its ears have laid back and its hackles are up. This moose does not want me to stay around. And although it does have a good escape route here, this is taken in the spring of the year and the moose has gone through a winter trying to conserve all its energy. So in this instance here, the moose is trying to determine whether or not I'm a threat, but he's also telling me by his body language that I'm too close. So it's time for me to back off. Um, this is paying attention to the body language. Moose will do it. Elk will do it, deer will do it. They all have similar body language when it comes to showing their dislike for us being there. The ears laying back is the most common. Uh, go to the next slide. So here we have some, I have a image of a sheep on the left side and a mountain goat on the right side. <clears throat> There's two different uh, species of sheep. There's the bighorn and the thinhorn. 
And what you'll most commonly come across in the GDT is the bighorn. And it'll be the Rocky Mountain bighorn. Thinhorn sheep are more prominently found in northwestern BC, but you'll also come across mountain goats. So mountain goats have thin black horns that extend backwards from their head and don't do a full curl. The, the rams during breeding season, uh, they compete by headbutting to determine dominance. And while they're going to be focused on themselves and stay away from people because they're, they're a species that escapes by running, um, if you get too close to a ram, it will turn and come towards you using its head to ram you. So again, with these species, it's just best to give them the space that they deserve. Mountain goats uh, often move off. They use escape terrain, uh, which is high vertical cliffs to get away from predators. So they're very seldom a confrontation with people. If we can jump to the next slide. Yep. I would say goats also love salt. They love eating like the grips of your trekking poles or shoes or anything they can they can lick. Here's a a caribou. Now caribou are very quickly dwindling in Canada and particularly in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, I believe it's the Moline herd. Uh, was recently uh, just notified as being extinct after a natural cause. So caribou, very similar to elk, have an antler that kind of just matched their name. Um, they form more of a C, so it helps you remember that they're caribou versus an elk. One main difference as well between uh, sheep and goats that have horns Cervids have antlers, which shed every year. And so that's how these the antlers that I uh, were was holding came about. They were actually shed off antlers during the winter. Uh, the mountain goats have horns that continue to grow year round, or sorry, not year round, but throughout their life. Uh, and so do sheep. So you can actually age them based on their on their horns. Caribou are an inquisitive animal for the most part, and if they don't know what something is, they may come closer just to get an idea of what it is. But again, there are species that will uh, use their ability to flight to get away from you. So although they may be inquisitive and come close, they will move off. Next slide. So here we have some tracks and, and one of the really interesting thing about being shown pictures of tracks is trying to determine what they are. Um, but as you can see in some, they have scale and in others they don't. The top right picture has scale which helps uh, determine what animal it is. And although it's in the snow and doesn't fully um, it's melted out snow, so it kind of skews the track slightly. It is a good example of various cervids. There's goats and sheep and caribou in these images, as well as the elk. Uh, do you have anything to add to this one? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I, I think it's just interesting. They're all quite similar. Um, and so it's especially in snow or in mud that's been kind of washed away or melted it can be quite hard to distinguish if you um except for size like the a deer is going to be definitely smaller than a moose but besides that it's just interesting they all have a very similar print mm -hmm. yeah you can go to the next slide so on the gdt uh you'll encounter two different types of bears you have the black bear and the grizzly bear 
a, a really common misconception with black bears is that they're always black. Black bears come in different color phases. Uh, it's really common to see cinnamon bears. You'll have a pure black bear with no brown snout, pure black bear with a brown snout, black bears that have white patches on them. You can get blonde bears. Um, they really do come in all colors. Grizzly bears are similar. Uh, these ones that are imaged here are very light in color and they can get very dark in color. Grizzly bears can also have uh, patch phases as well, uh, which gives them very, very unique coats. But they do have very distinct features from each other because although they're very similar species, they have uh, developed to have uh, to live in different environments and with different needs. So the black bear um, has a thinner shaped face with generally shorter ears, whereas the grizzly bear uh, has a very large head. It's very dish shaped, uh, shorter in the face, has ears that tend to be tighter to its head, and then it's got the very distinctive hump on its shoulder. They also, and we'll get to this a little bit later in the presentation, they have different tracks. Um, you very seldom will see it in pictures or when you're looking at them because their feet will be covered in grass. But grizzly bears are primarily a digging uh, bear that roots down for roots, tubers, small mammals. And so their claws are developed to dig deep and they extend very far in front of its foot. There's a black bear has shorter claws and you'll often find black bears in trees as opposed to grizzly bears. If you look in the image to the left on the slide, you'll also see that that bear has a cub that's going up the tree. It's about two thirds of the way up the picture. So when we encounter bears, um, you may not always see them for where you think you're where we expect to be looking. Um, the sow will quite often stay on the ground and will push her cubs up the trees. This is where they get their protection from. Um, in in bears, the during breeding season for them, which is in the spring, the boars, so the male bears, will actually try to kill young cubs just so that they can put the sow back into heat so that they can have an opportunity to breed with her. This is what make or gives us the idea of, you know, protective like a like a mama bear. Because the sow has to protect her cubs with everything that she has to prevent boars from killing her cubs. This is why uh, bears when they have cubs are a very risky situation to be around. So if you do encounter uh, sow with cubs, just give them the space, continue to talk and move away slowly and calmly. Um, and this will give you, they'll give the sow the knowledge that you mean no harm to her cubs and that you are moving away. Uh, we can go into the next slide. I kind of jumped into a couple of points there. <laughs> So what should we do when we encounter a bear? The biggest thing is to avoid any sudden movements. Um, continue to speak calmly. Never run away from a bear. There's bears will always outrun people. Um, they just they're a very fast species. As much as they lumber along and look like they're slow, when they need to, they can run very very quickly. So you want to determine the bear's behavior. You want to make sure, just like with the picture of the moose, how it was showing a lot of signs of agitation, you want to determine whether or not the bear knows you're in the area, if it's totally unaware of you, if it sees you, if it's moving towards you. What's the bear doing? Um, most of the time, bears want to avoid any interaction with people and we'll try to avoid it. But bears can also be kind of oblivious 
to act to what's around them as well. So that's where speaking to bears comes in. It just is to alert them that you're there, gives them the noise, gives them the presence and that little bit of movement. Um, you'll, you could encounter two different types of encounters with bears. One being a negative, or sorry, both being negative, which is a defensive or a predatory. Predatory bears are very, very rare when it comes to encounters with people. Uh, defensive encounters are more common. So defensive encounters are if you suddenly stumble upon a bear, neither of you were aware that either was in the area. The bear may be protecting its food source. It could be protecting its cubs. And it's important to remember that these defensive encounters seldom lead to physical contact with people. Bears, just like any, any other species, wants to avoid any physical conflict. They don't have hospitals to go to. They don't have vets to get to where if they get hurt, um, they can, they'll be okay. If a bear gets hurt in nature, even if it's a minor injury, it can progress to a significant injury, which will likely result in its death. Uh, so in, def in a defensive encounter, you want to remain calm. The bear will likely start popping its jaws, huffing at you. Um, it may sway its head back and forth. And the most intimidating is a bluff charge. When bear bluff charges, it, it runs at you and stops just short of actually making contact. It's really, really important when a bear does bluff charge to just stand your ground and not run away. If in the moment of a bluff charge, you try to run away, it's likely to turn that bear from a defensive to a predatory because it knows it has you on the run at that point. So lots, lots of literature talks about talking to the bear and even suggests what to say to a bear. It's really advantageous to actually just communicate with it, talk to it like you're having a conversation. One of the advantages to talking to a bear like it's just another person you're encountering is it helps calm our body language down. It's, it makes it so that we're able to just Feel like we're having a conversation it lowers our heart rate which keeps us calmer it gives us the feeling that we're in a peaceful place having that conversation so it's more of a psychological advantage for us than it is for the bear to actually understand what we're saying um, keep your body language very calm if you get very tight or very nervous and you you make sudden movements that's going to aggravate the bear's behavior as well. So it's very important to stay calm. Take the time as soon as you encounter a bear in close proximity to make ready your bear spray, or if you have other deterrents that you're using, like a bear banger uh, or an air horn, get that ready so that you can, when it's when you need to use it, it's there. Um, learn how to use your bear spray too. Um, bear spray is a tool that gives us an advantage, but it's not going to be a, a tool that's 100% effective in all cases. Um, so there's also a lot of literature that speaks to playing dead during uh, defensive encounters with bears. Bears are a very, very powerful animal. Um, they do feed on carrion and although you could lay on your back using your backpack to provide protection and keep your hands behind your covering your neck to prevent them from biting at your neck and at your head a bear is powerful enough that if you were to hope that it'll stop after a couple of minutes you may be so injured that you may not be able to fight back if you need to or to get yourself out of the bush. So 
in a case where bear makes contact it would be a good idea to put up whatever kind of fight you can start with bear spray the best thing that bear spray does is it's a respiratory and eye irritant so it gives you time frames when the bear gets sprayed it's not going to like it it's going to try to get away from it it may roll its head into the dirt trying to get it off its face this gives you time to just move away keep backing up but don't turn to run away from the bear just keep backing up slowly keep the bear in sight as long as you can until you have a safe space where you can make some time and get away from it We also have predatory bear attacks. Uh, predatory bears are, are again rare. Um, and most of the time are totally unseen by people before they happen. It may be a feeling of, I notice something's there. Bears also have a smell to them. They're, they're kind of a musky animal. Um, and so you may notice an off scent if they're that close to you prior to them getting uh, to making contact. But bears that stalk, follow, disappear and reappear is a predatory bear that you want to get away from. Again, never turn and run. Keep that bear in sight. You, you'll want to start yelling at it. You want to make your presence known with a predatory bear. You want to make yourself look as big as possible because going back to bears don't want to get hurt. If they think that that confrontation is going to result in an injury for them, they're going to break away from it. Uh, if it does make contact with you when it's predatory, 100% fight back with everything you have. Um, and it's really important to note too, when it does come to bear encounters, most negative bear encounters are a result of a bear that's become habituated. So habituated is a case where the bear has learned that people are a source of food. And this is most often as a result of either bad food handling practices or somebody making a bad choice to feed a bear, um, wanting to get close to it. And once bears are food habituated, it's almost impossible to ever break that behavior from bears. Bears' minds work in a way that is all about food and all about sustaining their calories. Which is an interesting piece because that very nature of bears also makes encounters with them easy. Um, bears will find a spot that if it's too hot out, they'll go lay in the shade to just stay cool. If it's too cold out, they'll go sit in a spot where they can just absorb some heat. Um, and the same goes for when they're just trying to maintain their calories. If food's a little bit scarce, they'll just kind of lay down and rest. They won't necessarily spend their days wandering around looking for food. Uh, and that can also lead that behavior can also lead to surprise encounters. But in most cases with those, as soon as the bear realizes that we're in the area, they're going to try to jump up and run away. They are most often more scared of us than we are of them. We just see them as a great big animal and they see us as a great big animal. So that reaction that we get most of the time, that's the reaction they get. We can jump to the track slide. Oh, sorry, this was, uh, yeah. This bear here was just getting a little bit more agitated. So here's an image where he started popping his jaw. It's the same bear that was in the picture previously. We can go to the next one. So this is the the track image I was mentioning about bears. So as you can see, the grizzly bear track, its claws are much 
more forward on its toe pads than that of the black bear. That's because it it's a digging. Uh, it spends a lot of time digging, and it needs the long claws to dig deep. Black bears spend a fair amount of time climbing as well, um, and the, having the shorter claws gives them a better advantage to do exactly that. Um, one of the reasons they do climb is black bears spend a lot more time feeding on uh, vegetation, and one of the first food sources that they get into in the spring is often aspen buds up in the trees. So you'll find in the spring of the year as the aspens are starting to bud out, if you get into a good aspen stand, you can actually look up and you may find the bears in a bent over tree trying to pull it down and that'll be what they're feeding on. We can jump to the next one. Um, there's a link included with this. This is an encounter that got filmed um, by a firefighter who had a bear encounter and he does a very good job of staying calm, backing away. The video is about three minutes, a little bit longer. Um, and eventually he does deploy his bear spray and the bear does turn and run away. He does a great job of backing away. I, I'm not quite sure why he chose to go as long as he did. I think he wanted to avoid every negative encounter with the bear uh, and try to give it the space but this bear is very curious and does display what we would consider to be predatory behavior. Its body language doesn't suggest uh, very predatory behavior other than what it's doing. Um, it's very calm, its ears are up, it's very curious. It's also a very young bear by its size and the size of its head. Um, as a, a little bit jumping back here, uh, we described grizzly bears as having a very pan-shaped head, dish-shaped head with short ears. When black bears get older, uh, especially the male black bears, their heads get bigger as they grow and their ears will shrink in comparison to the size of their head, giving them a more dish-shaped head as well, which helps give you an idea of how old the bear is. Um, the, the video is something that I do suggest you watch. It's very good material to get an idea of what a bear encounter may be like and the effectiveness of bear spray. Good on this one. Um, so I mentioned bears, problem bears that we encounter are almost always a result of some form of food habituation or an injury or an underlying problem that we don't fully understand from just that encounter. Uh, this bear here <clears throat> suffered numerous injuries over the course of its life and eventually led it to have interactions with people where people perpetuated the problems and then the bear continued to be to actually encounter more injuries as a result of uh, human interaction. So on its left radius and ulna, they were broken and remodeled. The remodeling is quite old and suggests that it happened when the bear was younger or years earlier. Um, and they actually twisted or sorry, they healed twisted. Uh, this would have given the bear a pretty predominant limp at this point, um, which would have had some hindrance in its ability to easily go find food. But once that healed, the bear would have still been able to survive and probably have lived quite a good life. During um, its healing process, though, at some point it found its way out near a highway where it started encountering people and getting a lot of food from people. If you look at its upper jaw, it looks very short, and that's because the bear was likely fed something from a can, a sharp object, maybe a chicken bone, and 
it ended up with an abscess in its jaw. And when an abscess goes untreated, it, it dissolves or rots away the bone. And so this bear actually was missing almost the upper quarter of its jaw just from that abscess, which then further put it into uh, a need and a want to get easy sourced human food. You can't really see these injuries in the picture, but it also had three broken ribs and a cracked sternum. And that was a result of being hit by a vehicle. The bear had gotten so habituated to people, it would walk out in front of cars just to try to stop them and get fed. This bear also had um, a uh, broken, it was actually shot, but survived the shot and that's up in its upper arm on the left side as well you can see some very significant remodeling so this bear should never have had these levels of injuries but by being around people where people kept having interactions and then kept feeding it this bear eventually found its end um and this this work was actually done by the University of Regina, which was pretty neat uh, to get it fully mounted like this and see all the injuries and what underlying conditions led to a bear being such a problem. So with bears, um, some final thoughts. To avoid any negative encounters, traveling groups. Um, if you, when we're making noise, we're being loud, we're in large groups, wildlife really doesn't want to have any interaction with us be aware of your surroundings watch for fresh bear sign watch for the tracks the scat if you're in an area of heavy berries uh, bears of course love berries if you smell carrion pay attention to that maybe move through that area a little bit quicker uh, never run from an encounter with a bear keep calm um, talk to it move away from it, keep your distance, um, and carry bear spray. Bear spray is an effective deterrent and one of the ones that we're allowed in most park settings. Uh, and it it is effective. It does have limitations on its range and you should be aware of um, a back wind that could catch the bear spray and cross contaminate you. So just keep that in mind. We can jump to the next one. So another species that's fairly common in BC and Alberta is the cougar. Um, cougar encounters are rare. Uh, they, they're a species that does hunt, we would think mostly at night, but it's actually in the dusk and dawn periods um, when we're generally settling into camp or we're still waking up. So um, encounters with cougars aren't very common um, and attacks by cougars are even more rare. A cougar attack would be equivalent to winning the lottery. Um, it's been almost 20 years since the last cougar attack. I believe it was 2001 or 2002. There was one in Alberta um was one of the last ones so <clears throat> understanding cougars um is they are the apex predator cougars are carnivores exclusively and do not eat any they they don't focus on any vegetation so they need to hunt successfully and without injury to be a successful animal their health is the utmost importance to them. So if they think they're going to get hurt or don't understand how to hunt an animal, they're going to avoid it. Um, cougars though are like your cat. They, they are curious and they will sit and watch and they will try to assess whether or not something is of interest to them. And you just, this is a very rare thing when it comes to encountering with people because people stand on two legs uh, and their prey are always on four. Um, 
So what to do when you're around cougars would be keep if you're traveling with a dog, keep your dog on a leash. Uh, cougars actually have about a 15% diet on canine species. So it, in nature, that would be foxes, coyotes. And although they also will be preyed on to an extent by dogs, um, they're, they are a, an apex predator that can handle a one-on-one -on -one encounter with a dog. <clears throat> um, of course, when we do hear about a cougar attack, they are very, very uh, publicized in the media when they do happen. So it grabs a lot of media attention and it becomes kind of like the movie Jaws where everybody was worried about shark attacks after seeing Jaws. Cougar attacks are kind of similar. Um, but in all fatal cougar attacks in North America, it was reported that they were completely unaware the cougar was in the area. So if you see a cougar, make noise, make sure it's not interested in you and back away. It's good to make yourself look bigger, more intimidating, because cougars do not want to get hurt. Where a bear could get hurt and go eat grasses and dig up roots for a while to sustain itself, if a cougar is injured, it will die because it can't get food it needs to hunt to get its food. So traveling groups, if you are traveling uh, where there's cougars or a high density of cougars, again, never turn and run. Um, and if a cougar shows aggression, be aggressive back. Yell at them. Uh, you want to throw something at them. You want to convince that cougar that if it comes for you, it's going to get hurt and it's going to uh, suffer worse than you will. So the other thing too, because they are a very powerful animal, we think, well, we couldn't fight back against a cougar. The way cougars attack is they they do a swift pounce to try to knock their prey off its feet and then they go for the head and neck area. We are not the prey that they've adapted to and because of that our skulls are shaped and thick enough that it's very very hard for them to bite down on and almost impossible for them to break through. So if a cougar does attack it will be it'll be a fight but it's a fight that people can work through and uh, can survive. So fight back with everything you have. If it, you do encounter a cougar that's aggressive and break its train of thought so that it moves on. And again, I just want to stress on that one. Cougar attacks are very, very rare. Um, but there are some healthy populations of cougars as well. BC has an estimated 7,000 cougars, Alberta 2,000, and in Saskatchewan we have a population estimated at about 1,000. So how can you tell the difference between a cougar track and a wolf track that are both similar size? The easiest determinant is usually look for the claws. Just like your house cat, its claws retract and you won't see them in its track. Uh, the next piece is going to be the three lobes that are at the bottom of the track. So if you look, the drawn diagram is very clear on the three lobes, but even that image below it, you can clearly see the three little lobes. Um, it'll have a wider pad than a wolf, and there's no X shape clearly through the toe pads, whereas with a wolf you can clearly draw an X through it, or even just look at the depression in the sand, and you'll see the X shape. And jump over to the next one. <clears throat> so another common species to encounter will be the wolf. Um, wolves are a really neat animal to encounter in the wilderness. It's not a very common one to encounter because they really like to avoid people. They 
they come in different colors. Um, the image on the left, these are all uh, wolves taken, uh, picture taken in Saskatchewan. And so we've got some that are very tan color to black. We've got some that are gray. Um, and they generally do travel in packs, although you can see them as single or lone wolves. They range, the average weight ranges between 60 to, they can reach weights of up to 130 pounds, although that's a very, very big wolf. Um, most probably hit the 100, 110 pound range. Of course, that can fluctuate based on what they're eating as well. Wolves will, uh, when they harvest an animal or make a kill, they'll feed on it for days until the whole pack has devoured it. And their bellies will actually distend just to get the food in while they have it. There are species that kind of go, can go through a feast and famine cycle. They have a very broad face compared to most uh, canines. Um, they have large feet. Their feet help them travel on snow uh, and move easily in the bush. They also have very long legs compared to most dogs. Uh, their fur is dense and multi-layered so they can survive our winter uh, weather that we have. And they're much larger than the average dog. Some people think they'd mistake them for a husky, but as you can see in the image on the right, there's a huge size difference on them. Uh, wolves are curious um, and will come close to determine what what we are if we're new to the area. Although if it's a heavily traveled area with people, wolves have kind of, they generally get educated to that, what we are and will stay away. Um, they're not often startled by human presence. They'll, they'll move away from it, but they may take time just to sit there and decide whether or not they're gonna move away. This picture uh, on the left, the wolves stayed bedded down there for probably about a minute or two before they decided just to calmly move away into the tree line. Um, if you're traveling in an area with wolves, uh, again, keep dogs on a leash if you're traveling with dogs. Wolves do, uh, wild wolves, do view other canines as a threat to their food source. Um, they'll view it as competition and they will attack another dog. Keep your food away. Um, just like with, if you're in wolf country, you're going to be in bear country. So proper scent management is going to be key just to avoid negative interactions with wolves. Um, if a wolf approaches you, similar to that of a cougar encounter, make yourself large, make yourself aggressive. They Wolves are primarily a carnivore as well. Uh, that's their makes up 90% of what they will eat. They'll eat grasses and pick at some berries, but th what they do survive on is going to be meat. So if a wolf gets injured, just like a cougar, it won't survive in nature. Um, and then just back away slowly, find a safe place. With wolves, they can't climb trees, so if you can get up onto something that a wolf can't climb up, that's a safe place to be. They will lose interest, they'll move away. That's all I had for wolves. Awesome, awesome. Was there any questions? Because I know I have a tendency to go quickly, so. Sometimes the questions do take a minute or two to come through, so we'll give everybody about a minute here, and then um, we'll also have a spot for questions at the end. I have a, a couple of slides just on food management in kind of bear country, so maybe I'll go through those and people can ask questions in that time, and then we'll move on to lightning. So as we kind of mentioned, oh, there, um, Alex has his hand raised. Alex, um, let me see. I can let you speak. Go for it. Your mic should be off. Or you can turn it off. Let's, one second. Is there a rule to keep distance? There's not a clear distance guide for how far to stay away. It 
if the wildlife is aware of your presence and unbothered by it, judge by their body language. If you see them from a long ways off, you're best just not to have the interaction. One interaction with wildlife can lead to another interaction with wildlife, not for you, but maybe for the next person, and then the next person and the next person. And so the more space that we can give wildlife and nature, the better it is for them. Because once we, with the example of the bear, once that bear had one interaction, it led to another and another and another because it gets more and more used to human presence. Um, I'd say as a general rule, if you could keep a minimum 100 meters apart, the wildlife will generally be unfazed by that. But keep in mind, an animal like a bear, a wolf, can cover 100 meters very, very quickly if it decides to. So the greater the distance, the safer you'll be. That's what Parks Canada suggests too. They say 100 meters for bear, cougar, and wolves, and then 30 for the cervid. So elk, deer, moose, sheep. Um, I mean, 100 is great for all. I think a lot of times, at least places like Jasper, you're going to see elk everywhere, especially in town. So sometimes 100 meters can be hard, but but yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and it does, um, like with especially the elk, because you see lots of images where people get... Um, down the states, the, the bison were one recently where a lot of hikers were trying to get close to them, or tourists, I should say, tried to get close to them. They will tolerate our presence getting very close, ungulates um, or cervids, but the more space we can give them, the more time that we have to react because they are a big animal. They will stand their ground until they feel unsafe. And as soon as they feel unsafe, they're going to do they're going to make their charge and we won't be able to get away at 30 meters. So the 100 meter rule is good for all of them. Mark asked um, about the efficiency or evidence against uh, using an air horn for a bear. He said he's heard mixed reviews. <laughs> What's your experience with that? I've had mixed uh, uses with almost all the deterrents. Um, Bear spray, I've had effectiveness where it gave me a time frame to move away, uh, but within a, less than a minute, the bear was right back to where he was finding uh, food before. So what happened in that case was the bear was already food habituated, and there was very, very little that you could do to get that bear to move away from people. Uh, that bear ended up being removed. It was a campground bear. Um, <clears throat> air horns can be effective, but again, the more interaction they have with them, the less effective they become. So if everybody's using an air horn and you'll, you'll see that, um, habituation to loud noises like air horns or bear bangers, where bears are frequently interacting with people. But if you're further back on the trail where the bear has very, very limited, interaction with people, you'll find them more effective. Awesome. So I'll jump back into these slides. We can, if any other questions roll in the next couple minutes, we can get to them here. Um, here's an image I found, the Bermuda Triangle. I love this picture. I know that um, in practicality, you're never going to find this perfect of a setup at a campground, but I think it just kind of shows, you know, the it, best practice if it was possible. Um, as Devin mentioned earlier regarding bear attacks, there was a big study in the States of several decades and 90% of all bear attacks involved food conditioned bears. So where bears had learned humans have food and their whole nature then changes when now they're going to finding food from humans. Um, and so I think this really just goes to show the importance of, you know, tiers of food protection. So um, like a bear can or an ursac is really like last case resort. There's several steps we can take to mitigate sm smells, drawing them to the location specifically. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll get into some of these strategies here on the next slide, but um, well, um, about reducing scent anyway, just to kind of walk through this image, it's great to not cook 
where you're hanging your food. Just because even as you're cooking, you're going to be releasing a lot of scent. And then, you know, say a bear smells this and they get to that, get to the site and there's nothing there, it might leave. But then, you know, it's like, oh, and then it can kind of trace it to the source. Um, that's when you're going to have more interactions with bears um, interacting with your ursac or bear can, which is really that last line of defense. So it's great if we can not have the specific scent located to the actual supply of food. So regarding some specific strategies, there's been a couple studies on um, scent and kind of scent diffusing. Um, so we found that bears can, uh, can track a scent for at least a kilometer. Um, most of the studies in this that found that they could smell a kilometer was from a carcass. So it's kind of important to think like, okay, so what is the source of the smell that they're smelling? You know, a carcass is very smelly. Like if you, you could probably smell a carcass as a human, say 20 meters away. If you open a cliff bar 20 meters away, you're not gonna smell it. So I think it's important to know how much scent is in the air is going to affect what the range that an animal is going to smell it from. And, you know, despite whatever scent it is, um, scent diffuses through the area um, quite quickly. Um, I mean, bears can still pick it up from a long ways away, but if we kind of get down to these methods of reducing scent, we can use distance in the same kind of way. So like at 30 meters away, only a third of the, the scent remains compared to like if your nose is right up next to it. At 100 meters, you're at 10%. And then as you go um, past 100 meters, it drops off sub substantially. Um, <clears throat> so there was a study done a few years ago, I guess about 10 years ago, about kind of the the, the odor proof sacks, the smelly proof bags um, and how well they worked. What they did is they put a bunch of food in these bags and then put them in a locker in a, in a high school. And then they had like two locker rooms. One is like a control with just food in a locker. And then in the other situation, they had food in a, a smell proof bag and then in the locker. In this situation, the dogs found the food um, in both situations, but I think it's important to notice that the kind of distance that the dogs were from the food was really close. So they were being put into a locker room where they were, it was it was a few meters that they were trying to smell. And so, it, you know, if the bear, if the dogs in this um, study were maybe not even in the locker room, we don't know if they would have smelled it. So I think this, that's, uh, there is some controversy over if these bags work at all, but simply from kind of a stats point of view, if you look at these methods of food storage, this is how much scent is reduced. So just a plain old Ziploc bag reduces scent by about five times. And so if we're looking at a bear um, outside, um, the distance in which a bear can smell something average in a Ziploc bag is anywhere from like 30 to 100 meters. And, you know, a lot of things are going to affect this, like wind and um, how stinky the food is, but that 30 to 100 meters. So if we're either way, that's way too close to be in a campground. Ideally, we're not going to, the bear will be in that campground probably every night because it smells food. So Nilo flume is like the, the turkey bag. Um, uh, the turkey broiling bags, which is that like really thick plastic. Um, some people use it for pack liners. Um, this is also um, similar to the odor proof sacks and um, the sm smelly proof bags. The odor proof and smelly proof bags are a little bit thicker just from the, the, the ones I've seen, like the odor proof and smelly proof bags are about seven mil thick. Um, the Nyla flumes, at least the ones I've seen, have been four. So you can maybe double it from there. But so just using Nilo flume, it's a 20 times reduction in scent. So now bears are going to have like a 20 to 30 meter range on kind of, you know, it has to be 10 to 30 meters close to the object for it to say, oh, there's food in the area versus a kilometer away. It's almost impossible that a bear would smell food um, from that distance and be able to locate it. And then kind of the best option for food reduction is mylar. That's what, you know, your really nice copy comes in. It's like what a, um, a cliff bar comes in, that kind of metally plastic. Um, that's the best at reducing scent. 
um, with mylar, it's several layers of different material. And so all those layers and with a really good seal, it has the best reduction in scent. So mylar alone um, is a thousand times reduction in scent. So now instead of being a kilometer away, the, the bear has to be one meter away to smell it. And so then if we think, OK, well, if my food's in a mylar bag and it's all, like, for example, um, that's what a lot of dehydrate or freeze dried food comes in. And then I'm also using a smelly proof bag or a nylon flume bag. Um, and then maybe it's in a Ziploc and in the ear sack. If you combine all those things, the bear has to be one to 10 centimeters away to smell it. Um, and at that point, you know, its face is right next to your ursac or bear can. And so I think we think, oh, my food's in an ursac or it's in a bear can, um, it's protected. But based on kind of hab habituating bears with humans and also just attracting them with scents, it's, it's better to kind of hit it higher upstream where bears are no longer even smelling that scent and having it be identified with a particular object. You know, there's no avoiding we have to eat when we're out hiking. Um, but you know, if we're cooking, the kind of wind will blow it away if there's not, you know, physical food on the ground. And so using a combination of these things is really kind of the best bet. Um, another strategy I know if people are out for longer hikes, a thing that I personally found works really well is you know not necessarily always cooking at the campsite. Um, I know sometimes at campsites it's nice because they have tables and when they have like the metal bear lockers, I mean, that's totally the setup that's that that's intended for. But especially on some of the more remote sections or if you're really trying to put in some bigger days, if you do lunch or sorry, dinner at like six o'clock in the evening, maybe you can be at a really nice scenic spot like up on a ridge. You can eat there, keep hiking. It's one less thing to do at camp and you're not going to be having any of that cooking or eating scent specific to the campground, which does a really good job at not creating this pattern of bears wanting to go to campgrounds where they smell food all the time. And so, yeah, anyway, this chart I found um, there's some good information. If people are more interested on kind of the studies around um, bear scents and bear safety, Backpacking Light did a fantastic uh, podcast and webinar on this as well. Um, if you type in backpacking light um, podcast, it was it's one of the more recent ones. Also, I just wanted to also talk about hanging an ursac. I think a lot of times people can get kind of uh, have a bit of bravado if they have an ursac or a bear can. I know with a bear can, it's hard to pick up because it's round, but um, an ursac, there are definitely cases of bears just picking up the thing and taking it home with them. So I think it's important to know what's the proper way to tie it. So, you know, this looks almost perfect, except I would say that tree is a little on the thin side. Um, you know, if a bear wanted to, I think it could probably break that tree. Um, but it's tied up tightly to the tree, which is kind of a key thing that I think is forgotten a lot. If an ursac is tied to a tree and there's like, you know, six inches to a foot of slack, it's that much more power a bear can grab and pull, and then it can maybe, uh, snap the tree, it could snap the rope. Um, but if it's tied tight like that, it doesn't really have anything solid to grab onto and it's just a lot more secure. Next, I'm going to jump into thunder and lightning. Give everybody another minute. Oh, Justin asked any statistics on grizzly population through the GDT? Um, a lot. I don't have specific numbers. Do you know, Devin? I, I don't know specifically. Um, I I am aware that the BC side has a very healthy grizzly bear population, um, and Alberta's side continues to grow uh, with healthy grizzly bear populations as well. So, <clears throat> well, I believe they're still listed as threatened in Alberta. The grizzly bear populations there are continuing to do well. So, uh, there will there will be plenty of them and um, they're yeah they're there. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, based on terrain, is an ursac re recommended or a bear hang? I would fully say an ursac. There's going to be several instances if you're doing a full through hike. Um, for a full through hike, um, some kind of bear proof storage is now required um, when you're wild camping in Banff, so that's section D, um, and then other sections like section B. There's going to be a lot of spots without it, it would take you a long time to do a proper bear hang where um you know i haven't done one in so long but 
the proper where it's I think three meters high and three meters from the tree or something like that. The perfect tree is so hard to find in nature. Um, and it, it, like sometimes there's going to be, you know, like one kind of purposely built where there's two trees and they put kind of a bar across and there's cables. Like that's totally fine to hang. Those are meant to be hung that way. Um, but an ursac is nice because you just got to find a sturdy tree and tie it. Um, it's also it gets smaller, unlike a bear can, which also works great, but they uh, they're just pretty big and heavy. I would say of the GDT hikers in the past three years, well over three quarters of them all used an ursac and some used bear cans. Um, and I've only talked to one person that didn't use um, a bear can or an ursac ever. I saw there was another chat that came in. Any info on tricks? Tricks to uh, what in particular? Uh, oh, on ticks. ticks. Sorry, <laughs> we were just chatting about this earlier that we should have included a slide on ticks. Um, ticks are most prominent in the spring. So for most people hiking in the Alpine, it's not nearly as big of an issue. Um, we were just chatting, you know, Lyme has been found a bit in Canada, but Lyme disease is the most prominent. Um, I think it's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is the most prominent issue ticks have here in the Rockies. Um, but in general, for people hiking, say starting late June, early July, that's pa that's past peak tick season, which is which is good. But um, you know, we can we will have an we have another webinar later this spring um, about kind of some natural history on the GDT um, and we're going to include some on some smaller animals. We'll definitely talk about ticks um, because I realized we did not talk about it in this one. And I'm going to make myself a note too. All right, I'm going to jump into thunder and lightning. Um, so here's a picture. This is section B in the GDT. Um, a beautiful day, but in the background, you can see something brewing just beyond the far, the far ridge there. Um, it was less than an hour and we got walloped by an absolute thunderstorm. And I think this just goes to show how quickly they can roll up on you, especially here in the Canadian Rockies. So first I wanted to talk a bit about the prevalence and risks of lightning. Um, you know, there's there's so there's thousands and thousands of lightning strikes in Canada every year, um, but you know, there's only about 180 people are struck per year um, and only two to three die. So, I mean, nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to get injured either, but the risk of death is actually quite low, relatively speaking, um, if you're just looking at those proportions. Um, and the, kind of the bad side is that the when so um, Stats Canada did a survey on people that were struck by lightning and more than half of them were hiking. So I think it goes to show that this is, I mean, hiking is a pretty low risk sport, but um, being struck by lightning is one of the biggest risks. But I will say it's also something that's very avoidable. Um, you know, there's nowhere truly safe in the outdoors with lightning. Um, unless you're the only really safe place is in a car or in a house, but there are a lot of steps we can do to reduce our risk. Um, to give people a bit of a picture, so July has the most thunderstorms here in BC and Alberta. Um, lightning can strike from up to 15 kilometers from the storm, so even if you see it quite a ways off, um, it's still time to go to kind of some safe spaces I'll talk about later. And the Canadian Rockies are a very unique place for thunderstorms. Um, so, I mean, thunderstorms form, we got warm, moist air, and then it pushes up into cold air. Um, and there's kind of a few ways that it can happen, but mountains are one of the most prominent ways that thunderstorms happen. So we have all this hot, warm air that's hanging out kind of over the, the prairies, and then it travels west and it hits the Canadian Rockies and has nowhere to go except upwards. This is called an orographic thunderstorm because it's being forced up by mountains. Um, and then when you have this mixing, you have um, thunderstorms. And that's why we see so many thunderstorms on the eastern flanks of the Canadian Rockies. Um, <clears throat> so I'll jump into kind of the different kinds of strikes. Um, and then we can get a better idea on kind of how to mitigate some of the risk. So interestingly enough, when most people get struck by lightning, it is not this bolt just zapping somebody straight to the head. 
Um, almost half of all lightning strikes are through ground current. So that's where it strikes an object and then it reverberates through the ground. Um, and so say, for example, it strikes this tree. It can be fatal up to 10 meters from this tree. So when we there's I'll talk about um, kind of choosing locations later, but you know, if you're next to the biggest tree and the tree gets hit, if you're within 10 meters of the tree, you can still die. And up to 30 meters away, you can still get an injury, which is is very far if you think about um, you know, a big tree over there, the fact that it can still get you. The next most common is uh similar to a ground current, but it's a side flash. So it's where another object is being struck and then it jumps from that object to you. So these pictures I find really illustrated perfectly. It's coming down the tree and then it jumps to you. We're excellent conductors. We're lots, we're filled up with water. We make excellent pathway for electricity. The third most common is through contact. So that is by us actually touching the, the object that's being struck. So it's similar to a side flash, but it doesn't actually have to jump through the air. It doesn't jump from the object to us. It's because we're touching it. Um, and from kind of a hiking perspective, this can look like trekking poles, carbon fiber, aluminum, steel, whatever they are, they're great conductors. If our pole gets struck and we're holding it, we're gonna get zapped. Um, tents like tent poles, aluminum, great conductor. Um, if we're in the tent and we're touching the tent, um, it can get us a tent also. It could be side flash. A tent could also be ground current. Um, and then also backpacks. You know, a lot of them have aluminum stays or carbon fiber stays in them. Those are all great conductors. If it hits the backpack and we're touching the backpack, that can um, also lead to us getting struck. Uh, one kind of strike that a lot of people don't realize can happen is what's called an upwards leader. So it's it can happen before you even uh, like um, how can I say this it because it happens from the ground. It's not like the bolt comes down and gets you. Um, it's what happens when the ground is so charged that it makes a connection with the, with the clouds above. These are most common in wide open places. So um, instead of it being like actually a direct strike that hits you, there's so much energy in the ground that it creates the lightning from the ground up and it connects as we can see kind of in this picture and that's about 10 to 15 percent of them and a lot of times if there hasn't been a lightning strike or thunder yet it can be confusing because people um, don't realize that there's lightning occurring yet and finally there's direct strikes i mean this is only three to five percent of oh sorry three to five percent of strikes not deaths it's the least likely um you know we're relatively small when we think of the grand scale of you know peaks and giant trees um so i mean direct strikes are the least common way of being struck by lightning but they definitely still pose a risk especially when we look at um specific uh places So as part of this, um, it's really over making informed decisions. You know, weather forecast and weather trends are huge. Like it, thunderstorms aren't as common late August when we when it's much cooler. You know, the the hot energy of uh, temperatures we have in July, particularly uh, like the first half of July, is when a majority of the thunderstorms are, particularly in the Rockies. Um, tying into this is timing. Um, Planning how you're going to be hiking is pretty essential. Like, it's not very often that you're going to have thunderstorms at nine in the morning or even eleven in the morning. But you know, two, three, six p.m. Um, the the risk of thunderstorms increases as you get past twelve o'clock. And so, a a big part of planning out your day is okay. If you want to take the high route, or you know, I have to go over this pass, it really kind of puts the focus on you know I should really try to be over this by twelve o'clock. Um, and I think, you know, you can look at weather forecasts if it shows there's going to be precipitation or if it's been warm. I mean, all of these things increase the risk of a thunderstorm happening. Um, thankfully, there is there are great devices now like inReaches or Zolios where you can get a weather forecast. I mean, as a lot of people know, weather in the Rockies is very unpredictable. But, you know, if you see chance of thunderstorms, that's a great indicator that maybe I shouldn't take this high route alternate, or maybe I shouldn't go up to this like peak in section E. There's spots to climb a little higher. 
it can just give you more insight to make it a more informed decision on, you know, maybe today is not the day to do this, even though it's like, oh, well, I'm right here. You know, the the chances of being stuck um, are quite high, especially if you're up, you know, deep in the Alpine and there's not a great way to retreat. You can really be put in a in a tough situation that's um, pretty much avoidable if you just choose to start your day earlier or try to get down early, um, by like that kind of afternoon time. Also, I think it's important to have kind of a safety plan. If you're um, thinking about where to set up camp, I chose this picture because this is probably the worst spot you could be camping if you're somewhere that has thunderstorms. Um, you know, you're set up for camp, all your stuff is there. It's gonna be really hard to retreat. You know, it's gonna be pouring down rain or hailing and getting up in the middle of the night. You know, if you have a thunderstorm or even mid afternoon, if you're all set up, it's going to be a huge pain in the butt. So in situations where it's a place that gets a lot of thunderstorms, the Canadian Rockies get a ton. Um, this would be a pretty terrible spot to camp, um, even though it's very um, Instagram worthy. Um, and so I think related to that, it's important to have a safety plan. So if you are making choices where it's like, oh, I'm going to be up on this ridge, it's going to be a little bit later knowing, OK, where are places I could really book it to if a thunderstorm rolls in or if I if I'm up here, am I going to be kind of stuck up on a ridge for a bunch of hours? And am I going to have to like, you know, be in the heart of a thunderstorm on top of this peak? I really hope you're not. But just kind of coming up with a plan on how to avoid these uh, these interactions. Tied to that is kind of the 30 30 rule. Um, if people aren't aware, um, if thunder and lightning, if the gap between the two is 30 seconds or less, it can definitely hit you. Um, it can lightning can hit about 15 kilometers away. Um, and so to give you a bit of insight into that time, the time between thunder and lightning, so say it's uh, 21 seconds, divide that number by three, and that's how many kilometers away the storm is. So that would be seven kilometers away. 30, uh, 30 seconds would be 10 kilometers. Uh, for people from the states, um, divide it by five, and that's miles. So if you have 20 seconds between thunder and lightning, that's about four miles away. And then it's kind of on the flip side, the other half of the 30-30 rule is about um, 30 minutes after the last thunder is kind of when that storm might be gone. It doesn't mean there's not another one coming, but if you're thinking about, okay, when do I need to stop, you know, hunkering down, 30 minutes afterwards is generally an accepted kind of rule of thumb on okay that storm has subsided it's moved on it's no longer in um, my direct area and it's that specific storm is no longer dangerous to me so here's a slide that i found i think this was from um, u.s national parks that i thought was excellent and kind of looking at the the different spots and different hazards each spot has so we talk about how this is about how safe each spot is. So a zero on top of this, this is the least safe place you can be. Um, I, I like that they included a few things that um, are somewhat counterintuitive. Um, so I mean, here we have all these peaks across the top. On the far left here, we have this little cave. In general, caves are not very safe places to be. Um, even though you think, oh, well, like I'm not getting rained on. What can happen is that the lightning can strike the top of the cave and then the whole cave can experience a ground current or it can experience kind of a side flash. And so um, caves in general are not very good um, situate are not very good places. You know, if it's really deep, that can that becomes a bit more debatable, but um, there's not that many really deep caves. There's a lot more of these kind of little pockets that we encounter. Um, moving down into this wide open area, again, there's really nothing around us. So this would be a potential for an upwards leader um, or ground current because really there's nothing to protect you here at all. Kind of in the middle, they show that descent route. Um, goalies are better than ridges. So talking about that safety plan, if, if a storm did come in, how would I get down from here? Running down the ridge is the least safe place to be running down. If you can find some kind of depression, a creek bed, um, anywhere to kind of get you down, um, especially places that have uh, like small trees, anything that can kind of disperse your, your likelihood of being struck. 
we kind of get down um, lower open water. I think that's obvious. It's another large open area um, kind of surrounding the lake in that picture. We see three big isolated trees. Um, they're the biggest trees in the area. Um, and especially when we think, you know, people aren't getting directly struck that often. It's more kind of ground current or um, that it's a side flash. Being by the biggest isolated tree is not the best spot. So the best spots in this image anywhere are kind of these small trees on the back ridge in this like depression here on the far right or the really small trees on the far left. So I think it's just important that, you know, it's not about just always being in trees, but what tree are you next to? Carol said the issue I've had explaining risk to people is that most don't, don't understand that if there is thunder, there is lightning. Yeah, every single time there's thunder, there is lightning. There's no way thunder can happen without lightning. Lightning's causing the thunder. When the lightning goes through the air, it's heating up the air so much with all that voltage that it's creating the thunder. Yeah, um, I and yeah, I think it's it's important to I mean thunder you don't have to see so I think that's especially during the day it can be quite hard to see lightning and you know not every lightning results in a bolt there can be kind of lightning that just stays up um, in clouds um, but yeah anytime you hear thunder um, just assume that there's a there's a risk of being struck so what do we do if we get in a situation where I'm in a thunderstorm I can't really retreat anywhere I just have to ride this out Basically, the worst thing you can do is lie on the ground. Um, you're increasing the amount of space that you're touching on the ground. So you're increasing your risk of ground current, the highest, um, the most prevalent way of being struck. So this is kind of the perfect image on what to do. Um, <clears throat> in this situation, this person, they are on a foam mat. Great way to kind of, any way you can insulate yourself from the ground is great. Um, a backpack can also work. Just make sure like if your backpack has a metal frame in it, it's not going to help. I know some backpacks, it's really easy to pull out the two frame stays. Um, if you do that, that's just another layer. Um, you know, people with folding pads, those work great, or even some kind of clothes. It's probably going to be pouring down rain, so you might not want to get your clothes wet. But um, any kind of way to insulate you from the ground here for things that don't conduct electricity is great. Um, again, it might not be particularly intuitive, but if you can space yourself out from your hiking buddies about 100 feet, that's the best. When we talked about how far these kind of ground currents can reverberate, you, know, you want to reduce the risk that everybody gets struck at the same time. There was um, a couple of years ago in Montana, there were some park rangers that came across hundreds of elk that had all died from, um, from a lightning storm. And what they found is that all of them were clustered together during the storm and a ground current killed all of them at once because they were all next to each other. So spaced out from your friends so that, you know, if one person gets hurt, not everybody's getting hurt on a foam pad um, on the balls of your feet. So kind of up on your tippy toes. Um, I mean, you don't want to fall over, but just perched up a little bit. That's going to reduce the contact that you have with the ground. And so it it's going to be that much less voltage that can kind of make it into your body. Just like the same reason we don't want to lay down. We want to have as little contact with the ground as possible while also staying low. Also in this picture, it's a little hard to tell, but having your heels touching. If you have your heels touching, there's the possibility that the lightning's just going to go up one foot, hit the heel and go back down into the ground. Um, if you have it separate, it can, for it to create a full path, it might go through your whole body into your, you know, your your box of life, which is kind of your chest and abdomen here. So having it have a short little pathway like that is great. Um, also, um, kind of head down and like that, it's just kind of the most protected way we can be, you know, a lot of parts of your body touching. So, you know, say it gets to just your legs, it goes down or just to the arms, not being completely outstretched like this, tucked into a ball on our toes on a foam pad. If someone is struck, 100% you need to go to the hospital. Um, if immediately, make sure it's safe. Um, you don't want to go out and rescue someone if there's a risk of you being struck too, because two people that got struck by lightning is not a good situation. Um, if 
it's finally safe and you go out there and you see your friend or even if it's a stranger, if they have a pulse and they aren't breathing, just do rescue breaths. If there is no pulse, start CPR right away. And no matter what, even if somebody gets struck and they think they're fine, 100% hit the SOS button on your Zolio, your PLB, your inReach Mini. There's a lot of signs that can manifest maybe a day or two later, particularly cardiac issues, um, where because you're getting zapped so strongly, you can go and you can have an irregular heart rate. Um, you can you know just kind of be coping for a bit and then deteriorate quite quickly. Um, there can be a lot of hidden issues like in your organs. Um, you're going to be in like, you know, a fight or flight situation if you're in this situation. And, you know, dirt, when that happens, your body preferentially puts blood other places. So in some ways, it kind of shuts down a lot of the other organs like your rest and digest organs. And so if they have a problem, it won't be nearly as prevalent as it might be in maybe, say, 12 to 24 hours. So no matter what, you need to go to the hospital, even if you feel fine. Um, and that's it for me. Does anybody have any questions? And there's also, I will say, there was a fantastic um, podcast by Backpacking Light on um, lightning. And then also um, NOAA, N-O-A-A, -A, that's um, Oceans and Atmospheres, an uh, organization in the States. They have excellent information on um, lightning safety and the um, U.S. National Parks nps.org they have great like one page flyers for um dealing with lightning especially if you live somewhere that doesn't get a lot of lightning like um vancouver bc coast the whole west coast so not nearly the same kind of prevalence of lightning compared to the canadian rockies All right. If anybody has any questions, feel free. You can use the chat or Q&A function. If you uh, want to talk it out, I can let people off mute too. whatever works for you. You know, sometimes there's a bit of a delay, so I'll give people a couple minutes just in case you're just hearing this now. Devin, was there anything you wanted to add about thunder or lightning risks? Um, no, I think you pretty much covered it. Um, <clears throat> being with so much when we're outside, it's paying attention to what's around you. We, It's easy to get distracted by the moment and forgetting, uh, you know, what surrounds us. And like you said, with the first picture, the clouds were building behind you and it, it really didn't take long before they caught up and so even just seeing the clouds build um it's those little details that we need to pay attention to mm -hmm. i i know a lot um one thing i forgot to mention is um it, a lot of people hike with gps watches now and if they have a barometer built in you can get storm alerts well before you can see anything if the the pressure drops really fast it'll indicate that something's moving in and you know it's not don't 100 percent rely on that but it's just another tool that can be nice to maybe give you a bit of insight that maybe we wouldn't have been able to have 15 years ago definitely a great point all right i think that's probably it then um Thank you everybody for coming. Devin, thanks a bunch for your info on, on the critters. We all appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming and thanks for having me. And... Yeah, and if anybody comes out with a question in the next couple of days, this will be up on YouTube tomorrow. You can uh, ask it in the comments and uh, we'll we'll get some answers up there for you. All right, take care of your night. Everybody have a good night. Night everyone.